One of your players likes the stabby stabby, but another likes the talky talky. A third prefers easy mode, where you get loots just for showing up, but the fourth wants to earn their reward. How then are you, the dungeon master, to balance the game for your dear, beautiful players? Kick out every divergent player. Everyone who doesn't enjoy the same game elements and style of play is out. <laughs> yeah, good luck. That would leave you with one player. Instead, I submit to you that there is a way to run D&D and other RPGs for that matter, such that the game appeals to all your players and they all have fun. So today we'll be covering 10 techniques to balance the game so that everyone has fun, including you, the dungeon master. Number one, create adventures with a mix of the three pillars of play. The fact is that not all players enjoy the same types of gameplay. Some like social interactions, the talky talky. Others like combat, that's the stabby stabby. And yet others like exploration, that's the, the, well, I don't know. I, I don't think we have a pet name for exploration. Any ideas? But the point is that if you have players that like different things, it makes sense for you to build a mix of the three pillars into your game. And even more specifically, when you create adventures, build the three pillars into the dungeon or whatever other location the adventure takes place in. For example, don't load up your game with social interactions if a couple players really like combat. This won't work out well for you. If you don't give the players some of what they want, they will figure out a way to get it for themselves. Ever wonder why some groups attack innocent shopkeepers and other NPCs they come across? Because you got no combats in your game. Or perhaps not enough. Or maybe they're just psychos, I don't know. But yeah. You designed your entire stinking game for them to walk around and talk to people. And guess what? They got tired of it. So they took matters into their own hands. But then what do you do? You turn right around and accuse them of being murder hobos. Did you ever stop to think that it might be your own darn fault? Maybe if you had balanced your game better and not taken the easy route of designing a game full of mostly social interactions, your players wouldn't go around killing every other NPC they come across. I don't know, call me crazy. I just deeply offended you because that hits a little too close to home. Sorry. By the way, for more information on the three pillars of play and how to implement them in your game, and especially how to place all three pillars into your dungeons or location-based adventures, check out my three pillars of D&D video from last week. Number two, vary each game session. This is gonna happen, folks. It does. It will. No matter how much you try to build variety into your game, talking, fighting, snooping about, you will have game sessions that seem to be heavily stilted toward one pillar. For instance, when my players enter a new town for the first time, we invariably spend most of the game session, or all of it, just exploring the town and talking to NPCs, which means the combat pillar gets completely neglected. Now someone might say in the comments, Luke, that's what bar fights are for, or criminals in the alley. And yes, I could interrupt what was otherwise an amazing game session, exploring a new town and meeting its key inhabitants with a mostly pointless combat. But sometimes that just doesn't fit organically into the session and would detract from an otherwise fun game session. So it doesn't always feel right to do that. Thus, if you find that you have a game session that heavily favors one or two pillars, just make sure that the next game session gives the players a dose of whatever was lacking. By the way, if you sometimes struggle with describing places, monsters, spells, and other scenes to your players, check out Describe. Over at Describe.com, you can find thousands of beautiful narrative descriptions that you can read to your players, perfectly setting the scene in their imaginations. Furthermore, Describe's Cartographer's Collection has interactive maps for you to use in your games. These these maps include finely crafted boxed text for their key features and can be downloaded for use in the virtual tabletop of your choice. Choose from a wide variety of maps such as Dragon's Volcanic Grave, Harvest's Throne at Night, and Shadow Portal. Check out Describe at the link below. Lots of content is available for free and if you decide to unlock everything with a paid subscription, use the discount code the DM Layer for 10% off your first payment. Number three, work the three pillars into encounter. Remember that every encounter with monsters doesn't have to be combat. In fact, it is the sign of a veteran game master that they allow characters to resolve encounters in a variety 
creative ways. But even beyond allowing your players that, you can build all three pillars into your encounter design. The characters spot the goblin patrol and decide to approach. The goblins demand to know who they are and what they want. The characters come up with a flimsy story almost completely unbelievable and you call for a deception check. They fail and the fight is on. And boom, you just hit social interaction and combat in one encounter. But what if the characters decide not to approach the patrol and instead to sneak around it. Well, there is a narrow cave opening nearby. Perhaps they delve in and see where it goes and if it can help them get by the goblins. And right there is your exploration pillar. When you're building location-based adventures, working all three pillars into the encounters isn't too tough. Now, maybe you can't hit all three in every encounter, but you can usually come pretty close. Number four, create encounters with a variety of difficulties. Some players enjoy a challenging adventure, with combats where you think you're probably going to die, but just might narrowly manage to survive. Other players want a more laid back experience with encounters where they're not freaking out about pending doom and destruction every moment of the game. So do both. Have encounters that span the range of trivial, easy, medium, hard, and deadly in your adventures. The specific mix will depend on your preferences and your player's preferences, but I recommend having the majority of your encounters being medium and hard with a few trivial and easy and deadly encounters thrown in. Typically my boss fights are deadly encounters. Oh great Luke, just after you depleted all all their resources getting through the dungeon, you hit them with a deadly boss fight. Yeah, that's right. I'm evil like that. It's also good game design in my opinion. Who wants an anti-climatic boss fight against a big bad that's dead in the first round? Can't really call that a boss fight at that point, can you? By the way, if you're finding the information in this video helpful or just enjoy eating nice, delicious hamburgers, Give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm down below. Let YouTube know what you like on your hamburgers. And if you don't like hamburgers, I I don't think we can be friends. What's, what's wrong with you? How can you not like hamburgers? Number five, use two to three different enemy types in encounters. Here's the thing with deploying only one enemy type, such as orc warriors against your players. First, it's rather boring to fight battles against just one enemy type. Oh, a bunch of orcs with axes, yay. Things get so much more interesting when you have orc warriors charging the characters, orc archers in the back pin cushioning the wizard and ranger, and the orc shaman causing even more mischief. Can you say spirit guardians? My, my players love that spell. Well, well, guess what? So do I. The next thing is that a variety of enemy types allows your players who probably have different sorts of characters, barbarian, rogue, wizard, cleric, fighter, to engage with that encounter in slightly different ways. The barbarian and fighter decide to handle the orc warriors. The rogue is going to sneak around and deal with the orc archers. And the wizard determines to lay waste to the orc shaman. This sort of variety in a combat allows your players to leverage their unique character abilities in ways that best suit the situation at hand. And the combat will thus be more fun for all your players as a result. Number six, balance your game between the campaign arc and character arcs. I have an older video on my channel. Oh, okay, it's, it's really old. <laughs> that talks about designing a game that features a main campaign arc, such as Lord Paxton trying to annex the cities and kingdoms of the Sword Coast to recreate the fallen giant nation of Astoria, and also features character arcs, such as Krindar trying to find his long lost sister, or Kasim working to establish a Church of the Horned God in Waterdeep. My point is that you should balance your game between the main campaign arc and character arcs. Some groups make the mistake of making a D&D game all all about the PC's backgrounds and individual goals. Other groups make the mistake of ignoring them completely. You are going to have players that love doing things that relate to their backstories and their character goals. And then you're gonna have players that don't give a flying crap about those things. They just want to beat the snot out of a bunch of bad people in the game world, find a big bad and thwart his evil plans. When you balance the game between those two types of gameplay, you can run a game that appeals to both sorts of players. Now, some games are going to veer heavily one way or another. My Curse of Strahd game, for instance, has little in it based on character backstory because the characters are not from Barovia. They just wanna kill Strahd so they can go home. But this is an exception to the rule. Generally, you should seek balance. By the way, if you want to learn more about campaign arcs and character arcs and how to build them into your games, see my D&D Campaign Creation Part 1 video. I put a link to that below somewhere. 
because I'm because I'm nice like that. Number seven, ask your players what they enjoy the most about D&D and then design your games featuring those things. Some of you are like, thanks Luke, some real cutting edge stuff you got right there. Talk to my players, thanks a lot. And yet, and yet, how many dungeon masters don't do this? Could be their chairs like. Yeah, <laughs> what I suggest also is not just asking your players, but observing them. Just because your player says they love social interactions doesn't mean you might not also see them really getting into combats too. This is just a general thing with human behavior. People will tell you a thing with their words, but their actions will tell you what they really believe. So pay attention. Number eight. Ask your players what they don't like. The funny thing is, people usually have a better idea of what they don't like than what they do. Like, I can tell you in a heartbeat that I hate it when spellcasters take forever to cast their spells and how much more boring that makes combats for me, both as a player and as a dungeon master. And I can tell you that I don't like puzzles, which are an exploration element. But ask me what I like and I might have to think a bit. For better or for worse, our negative emotions tend to be stronger and more intuitive than our positive emotions. This is why I believe the human race should be wiped out and replaced by dwarves or elves or something. No, maybe orcs because orcs, orcs aren't evil anymore. Orcs are just normal people. They're just like everybody else. Probably shouldn't put that in there. Somebody's probably gonna freak out on me. Oh well. It's too bad, leave complaints down below. Number nine, get feedback from your players. Ah! More talking to players, Luke, you suck. <laughs> I know, I know, sorry. Even if you follow all the techniques we've mentioned thus far and think that you really have your game balanced, dialed in, you probably still have room for improvement. And there are so many different things a game master does, we can easily lose sight of game balance or what our players like and don't like. And the next thing we know, we've veered way off course. So it is a good practice to routinely ask your players for feedback on the game. Specifically, I like to ask three simple open-ended questions using an anonymous survey monkey or Google Forms. Number one, what do you enjoy about the game that we should keep doing? Number two, what do you dislike about the game that we should stop doing or do less of? Number three, what is something that we should consider adding to the game and start doing? This is known as the keep, stop, start technique for soliciting feedback. Now you can just ask your players in person during a game session, but using an anonymous online tool is going to guarantee you more candid responses. Number 10, consider what you, the dungeon master, like and don't like. We've been talking about player preferences almost the whole time here, and many dungeon masters tend to think only about what their players want. However, it is a mistake to not consider what you, the dungeon master, enjoy in the game too. If you're not running a game where you are having fun playing, how long do you think that game is going to last? Lask, lask, lask last before you get burned out, lose heart, and call it off. Not too long, my friend, not too long. Click on the screen now to learn more about the three pillars of play in D&D, or to become a DM Layer patron and get an issue of Layer Magazine every month. And until next time, hamburgers are awesome. Prove me wrong.